What are quarks? Um, one of the big things that we try and do in uh, physics is to work out the building blocks of nature. What are the, the Lego bricks from which everything else emerges, you know, whether it be the chairs and the room, the, the doors, you and I. And um, for a long time, people thought they were atoms. Those were indivisible, they were the most uh, uh, smallest object that we had and nothing else uh, came close to uh, them in size. But then people like Rutherford showed actually that the atoms themselves weren't the building blocks because he was able to fire particles at atoms and bounce them off. And the way they bounced off indicated that the, the atoms themselves had a, had a nucleus and then in that nucleus, that small nucleus, it was realized that there were other objects which came to be known as neutrons and protons. And so for a while people thought neutrons and protons, along with the electrons, which many of us are aware of, many of you are aware of, were the fundamental building blocks. But um, gradually, as more and more experiments were being done in the turn of the century and into the 1920s, we began to realize there were other phenomena occurring which you wouldn't have expected if the neutrons and the protons were the basic building blocks. There was nuclear decay, called beta decay, occurring where what, what is a neutron would decay into a proton and it would emit other particles in it, um, an electron for example. And so it led people to start questioning, well, maybe the neutrons and protons aren't the fundamental building blocks. On top of that, there was the, the possibility, it became realized that there were more particles out there. They were um, forming what are called hadrons. So a neutron and a proton is an example of a hadron. It's made up, we now know it's made up of quarks, but at the time we didn't know that. But it was realized in the, in the early 60s that actually there were lots and lots of different types of hadrons. So you had this, if you like, this um, dilemma. As each year went by, they were finding more and more particles. And so you could either just start ticking them off, saying, yeah, well, here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. Or you could do what Gelman did, and actually Zweig did as well. And he began to say, well, maybe uh, these hadrons are made up of something more fundamental. Maybe the building blocks are not the uh, neutrons and protons, but something else. And they both real, uh, came up in the 19, early 1960s with the idea that there were the quarks. And in fact, they thought there were three, which they labeled an up and a down, and they labeled as a strange. And with those three, they did a great job in fitting all the known baryons uh, that were present in the, uh, that we knew of at the time. Uh, the strange one was there because um, when people looked at cosmic rays, particles created from cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere, these these baryons that were being produced or they were living a lot longer than people expected. And um, the, the idea of the strange quark is called a strange quark because it was the quark which explained this unexpectedly long-lived particle. So you had these three quarks. Um, but then as, as time went on, you went through the 60s, and by the way, in the 1969, Gell-Mann won the Nobel Prize. He didn't win it actually for the discovery of the quarks. Um, he won it for his earlier, well, along with the discovery of the quark, he won it for his earlier work in particle physics where he, he basically came up with a way of, of um, uh, tabling all the hadrons that were known. He called, they called it the, um, the uh, what was it, it was called, uh, he, he tabled them in, in octets, so groups of eight. So he was able to come up with a way of sort of understanding how one was related to another. But the quarks came a bit later on as a way of understanding actually what these baryons were made of. So in the 60s, uh, this work was being done. And then in the 70s, more work was done on the understanding, trying to understand the basic building blocks of, of matter. And um, it became clear that actually three quarks weren't enough. And initially, uh, I think it was um, Sidney Glashow, Sheldon Glashow, sorry, and uh, uh, Bjorken realized that there was a need for another quark, which they called a charm quark. And they called it the charm because they thought it was charming that this, when this quark was present, there was a lot of symmetry 
in the underlying models of particle physics. So now you had the situation where you had actually four quarks present. You had the up and the down and the charm and the strange. And then later on in the 70s, it was uh, realized that in order to explain something called CP violation, which is a property of particles, that actually you needed, it would be easiest to explain it with two more quarks. And those became the top and the bottom. And they were called the top and the bottom because the top linked to the up and the bottom linked to the down. And so now you had six quarks. And one of the massive problems that we face in particle physics is to try and explain this. Why do these quarks have the particular masses they have? And the second big question is, why stop at three? Why stop at these three generations? Why not have more? Uh, data observations seem to indicate there are only these three generations, but we don't have any really good underlying argument why there are only three and not any others. And here's another issue, especially for you, Brady, you know, with your, your phenomenal periodic table, right? It's been a massive success. You could ask yourself, which of these quarks, which we, we now think are sort of the building blocks of matter, which of these make up the, the elements that go in the periodic table, the elements that you and I are made of? And it's basically the up and the down. So the charm and the strange and the top and the bottom effectively have no role in our everyday existence. And so one of the, I've forgotten who said this, who made this quote, but one of the quotes that is in the world of particle physics is, who ordered this? Which is, who ordered these extra particles? They're needed, Gelman and Zweig showed that, they, that we needed quarks, they at least showed we needed the strange quark as an additional one. But why do we need these extra four? We do need them, they play a role in, uh, in interactions within the nucleus, but uh, in terms of everyday li life, you basically have the up and the down quarks. They make up the protons and the neutrons. And then you have the electron. And then finally you have the sort of the forces in between, which are the gluons. He's, he's remarkable, by the way. Have you, have you met him? I met him. I, I uh, met him. Of course, he won't remember that he met me, but uh, I certainly remember meeting him. I was at the most amazing meeting I've ever been at. I was a young postdoc at Fermilab, and uh, um, they organized a meeting on quantum cosmology, which is a different subject, but is basically trying to understand the very early universe. And this Fermilab is a, is a laboratory, a particle physics laboratory, just outside of Chicago, and that's where I was working. And so back in the, about eight, 1988, they organized this meeting. And so I was there and uh, they invited um, th three of the people that came were Stephen Hawking came and um, Murray Gell-Mann came, you know, Nobel Prize winner. And then the, the, the coup in many ways was they, they got a guy called Zeldovich. And Zeldovich was a Soviet physicist, a pioneer of cosmology, a pioneer of pretty much the whole of modern cosmology was, was Zeldovich. And so, and this was the first time he'd been to the US. So there we were, we were in the, in the um, auditorium. It was actually, it was a small room that we were all in and, and Murray Gell-Mann was giving his talk. And of course we were all listening in, in deference in some ways to what he had to say, except Zeldovich who at one stage jumped out of his chair and said, no, 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 no. And he ran up to the desk and grabbed hold of Murray Gell-Mann's pen and started scrawling over his transparency, at which point Murray Gell-Mann with his arms in the air, no, 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 and he's scrolling back on it. And then it went onto the blackboard as they're arguing. And I didn't know what they were arguing about, but it was just amazing, these two giants of uh, physics. You know, Murray Gell-Mann got the Nobel Prize for, for his earlier work, The Eightfold Way. That was what I was trying to remember, The Eightfold Way. And um, then he came up with the quarks along with Zweig. And they didn't get the Nobel Prize for that. Zweig didn't get the Nobel Prize. You know, for, he co-invented the quark, did it independently, co-invented them. He didn't name them, but he came up with the idea. And the reason he um, didn't get them, he didn't get it, is because um, because Gell-Mann got the Nobel Prize by himself in 1969 for his earlier work, um, you can't get a Nobel Prize again for, for joint work. So if he'd have got it jointly earlier on, then they could have got the Nobel Prize with Zweig, but he couldn't because he'd got it earlier. So Zweig missed out because of Gell-Mann's success. <laughs> so if a proton is made of quarks, 
What are quarks made of? Oh, people did try to imagine there were something pre-quark called prions, but there's no evidence for that at all. Uh, and this seems to be one of the standard elements of our understanding of elementary particle physics. People call it the standard model. And this part seems to be well-founded at the moment. But this whole story has shown you that you start off with a picture of two and then there's three. And then you think you've got a complete story and then somebody comes along and says there's probably a fourth and then they go and find it and all hell breaks loose. And then other people suggest there could be others and they have very strange names because people thought this was uh, an extra charming quark because it made the theory charming. But it wasn't complete even though they thought it was beautiful at that stage. And then they call this top and bottom to be the opposite up and down. Uh, some people call it truth and beauty. Anyway, they have these labels, and they don't mean anything, but all of those labels are called the flavour, without a U, because it's a sort of American conception. So, of course, in the world of particle physics, if you're, if you're interested in this kind of field, you keep probing. And uh, so there are groups of people who... I mean, the quark picture seems to work brilliantly. Um, it explains... Uh, quantum chromodynamics, it explains the interactions of the nucleons, it, it seems to work very well and, and so on the face of it we don't have to go any further but we're inquisitive souls and so people naturally have gone further they've tried to suggest that the quarks themselves may be made up of things called prions and uh, there are models which, which introduce prions and the quarks then become composites of different prions b bound together they run into issues uh, with experiments, which, you know, experiments probe for this. And uh, for, so they, they, I would say at the moment the, the, the feeling is, well, prions are interesting, but they're not the flavour of the month. They, they, we'll stick with the quarks.